Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And you know, you just, you never know, uh, just like with uh, Jamie and, and so many others here tonight, but it happens all the time that God speaks to us in all sorts of ways, dreams, visions, uh, inner kind of urgings, uh, thoughts, all these different ways that the Lord can speak to us. And uh, we really need to share those things because you never know, for your own benefit, you know, we it's a blessing for the person who shares it because they're in obedience to God. And they're actually speaking for God when they do that. And also, it's such an encouragement to other people who maybe haven't had the courage to step up and do it. They felt the unction or they felt you know, like they should, but then they don't. And uh, not to make them feel bad or condemned, but to give them the, the courage to speak up and share what God puts on their heart. I, I got an email from Jody right after church Sunday. and uh, Or not an email, I got a, a text message from her. And... Uh, said that she wanted my email address because she wanted to send me an email that she had sent out Thursday that was just almost what I was preaching Sunday, or it confirmed everything to her that that God had spoke to her to share with some people over the Internet. And then I preached this message on Sunday, so she, she, I gave her the email address and she sent it, and I down here yesterday and read it, and it was. It, it was just right on. So... And then Mark uh, came in tonight uh, before church, and we were talking stuff that I was going to be preaching about tonight, same things he's testifying about. And then the other testimonies we hear, it happens all the time. And uh, that's a huge witness. And, I, I, you know, one of the things that I want to talk about tonight is, you know, we, we just, we have this sense, when I say we, I just mean the church collectively, the body, this, this sense that we're not worthy to be used or that, you know, we don't have the confidence that God will speak through us, and uh, but He does, and He wants to. So, uh, without dragging out this any further, let me let me. I'd like to read to you a couple of scriptures uh, from Isaiah, and then we'll go to Ephesians chapter four. But Sheila, I'd like to read Isaiah uh, chapter forty-eight, verses three, and then verse six. Verse 3 and, and then verse 6 afterwards. So while Sheila's punching that in, just say, praise the Lord. Now, we, we do confessions at every service, declarations, uh, whatever, whatever you want to call them. And the reason we do it is not as a, you know, as a religious ritual of some kind, but simply to get us to understand that's a principle that God wants us to use. It's, it's a God thing. It's what God does. He speaks and things happen. But he's given us that same authority in the earth, but so often we don't do that. And uh, we, need to, we need to be able to uh, understand that it's through our words, just as God's words designed the universe and everything that's in it. Our words have authority to, to create in our lives and in our relationships and in our environment what we want in relation to God's Word. So it's not just something we do on Sundays and Wednesdays. It's something that we should be doing all the time. And uh, that's what I want to talk about a little bit tonight. But here's God's... He says, I have declared the former things from the beginning, and they went out of my mouth. And I showed them. So he says, I declared them first. It just were words coming out of my mouth. And then I showed them. I did them suddenly, and they came to pass. Now, that's the order that God operates in. He says it. Amen. It comes forth out of his mouth. He shows it. And we know it. We see it. It manifests, in other words. He speaks it first, then it manifests. Okay? Then verse 6, he says, Thou hast heard, see all this, and will not ye declare it? I have shewed thee new things from this time, even hidden things, and thou didst not know them. So he's speaking hidden things to us all the time that we haven't seen, and he's waiting for us to declare them so they can be seen. For you, for your situations, for your relationships, for your finances, for whatever it is, your health, 
This is the way it works. Now, it's already been done. The work is finished in Christ, but we still have to speak it. We still have to declare it. We still have to agree with him in order to see it manifest. It's, it's, the, it's where he says in another scripture in the New Testament, he says, uh, no, or, excuse me, not in the New Testament, but he says, it's like my word. I think it's Isaiah 9 or something. I can't remember now. But anyway, he says, it's like my word is like the snow and the rain that comes down out of heaven. And he says, it will not come back to me void. It will, if someone will speak, in other words, if somebody will speak it back to him, it will accomplish the purpose for which he sent it in the first place. So his word is not here for us just to memorize. His word is here for us to understand what he wants for us so we understand what his will is so that we can then speak that into the situations and circumstances that we're confronted with and get the manifestation of whatever his will is. That's what Jesus was talking about, even under an old covenant type of prayer where he says, okay, if you want to pray, pray like this. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, what's, what's the will of God in heaven? Well, we know what is in heaven is no sickness, no disease, no dying. Amen. Nobody's, uh, you know, standing on a street corner begging. Everybody's bills are paid. You know, everybody has a, a nice place to live. You know what I'm saying? It's all taken care of there. And that's the way we're supposed to be praying here, the same way it is in heaven. It should be here. All right? So he's, he's, this is what he's saying here in, in verse 6. All right. Uh, so that just set this up for, let's go to Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verses 13 and 14. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So the way I started out here tonight is that, you know, everybody wants to know what is the will of God. We want to know it about everything all the time. But the truth is, too few Christians really have confidence in their ability or their worthiness, if you will, to hear God for themselves, to know what His will is. Well, we know the Word of God is the will of God, but sometimes it's kind of vague when it's a particular situation or circumstance that you're going through and you can't think of maybe necessarily a scripture that you can apply. But God will speak to you in agreement with his word to give you the unction or the utterance, amen, that needs to be dealt, spoken in your case, into the circumstance or the situation. But the church is immature. This right here is telling us that the church is immature, and it has been for most of its existence. The reason is simply the inability to see the revelation of grace and the finished work of Christ. That will grow you up in a hurry if you can ever really get it. Amen? Because if the goal is just managing sin or if the goal is just keeping your bad behavior under control, praise the Lord, it seems to me uh, we've been failing miserably, praise the Lord, at least at my house, praise the Lord. I've got it together pretty good, Sally's. A work in progress. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I just said that because I didn't want anybody to think I was a coward. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. No, she's a good. She's a good person. Good Christian. Loves God. Amen. Thank you. Praise the Lord. I didn't ask for a witness, but sometimes, Hallelujah, the Spirit just gives utterance, right, Sheila? All right, so how about we give ourselves a chance to break free from uh, religious performance, the prison of that, the bondage of that, and grow up in freedom and liberty. It's the only way you can grow up. It's the only way you can really mature. So what Paul said in Ephesians 4, 13 and 14 is, in essence, what he's saying there is the more you mature 
the less we need rules. Let's, uh, let's look at Hebrews chapter 5, uh, verse 12, beginning at verse 12. And we'll go right on down through chapter 6, verse 1, but beginning at 5, verse 12. For when the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Right? For when, for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. Amen? For he is a babe. Praise the Lord. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God. Praise the Lord. So Paul's saying there comes a place in all of our lives where we should be teaching, but we're still needing to be taught. And the reason that is true is because we're, we're still wanting milk. Meat is considered truth. Milk is like vague principles, you know, kind of rules and guidelines, like I said before, like he was talking about in Ephesians chapter 5 or chapter 4. The more you mature, the less rules you got to have, Right? Little kids, you've got to have lots of rules. You can't play in the street. Don't get near the stove. You know, stay off the, away from the car. You know, don't do this. Don't do this. It's constantly you're having to put out parameters for them so they don't get past that. But the older that you get, the less you should have to be saying. I mean, when your kid's 20, you don't have to say, hey, you know, don't mess around the stove over there. You might get burnt. Chances are that he's been burnt often enough over the last 18 years that he knows that's not a good thing to do. Praise the Lord. But you say, you understand what I'm saying? The more we mature, the less we really need rules. That's the way it's supposed to be. But he says there that don't be, don't be fooled by men and deceivers that constantly want to keep you a baby. In other words, they're always enforcing rules, though you've been a Christian for 30 years, and you're still being told don't have, don't buy, don't go, don't do, don't, all these things, right? So, praise the Lord. After a while, what happens is we, we get to focusing on behavior and controlling sin so much so that he says it means that you can't eat meat. You're just stuck with milk, right? You can't have anything but milk. So churches become nurseries. They're full of howling babies who can't feed themselves. And after a while, that gets on our nerves. Ever had three or four howling babies? One is one will drive you right up the wall. But get a room full, right? And they start fussing and fighting and making messes. Or they take their toys and go home. I'm not going to play with you anymore, right? It sounds like church to me. Praise the Lord. And a lot of pastors are afraid that people will grow up. Because if they do, they may not be able to control them anymore. They might even develop their own minds. They might even hear from God themselves. Imagine that. What a concept. Praise the Lord. Back to Ephesians 4. Verses 14 through 18. Ephesians 4? Yeah, it does. It goes right on down through 32.
that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness in their heart. So, you know, we, they might, in other words, what he's saying is, they might begin to question this religious drivel. The spiritual milk that they're being asked to eat week after week after week. In, in Galatians chapter 2, and then we'll kind of shift a little bit here, but in Galatians chapter 2, you don't have to go there, Sheila, but uh, so I'll just leave it at that. It's in chapter 2. Paul says, stop the constant rehashing of the same old behaviors. Constant, you know, be good boys and good girls and behave yourselves and do all the good stuff and, and, and God will bless you. You know, learn to control your, your, uh, your sins. Manage your sins and, and God will bless you. Now, you can say, well, what is it, what is it Paul's talking about? If, if I were to go back there, and you can just look this up for yourself. I'm just doing this for the sake of time. But back in, in uh, uh, verse 11 of uh, Galatians chapter 2, where this whole thing starts, Paul is talking to Peter because Peter has been uh, living a life of freedom from the law. He's eaten with the Gentiles. He's, you know, celebrating with these people that are uncircumcised. They're not keepers of the dietary laws or anything else. He's eating the same food they're eating. He's celebrating with them and everything else. Then all of a sudden comes some Jew, Jewish converts to visit and he now avoids all of these other Christians and hangs out with these Jewish Christians who are still keeping the law, who are still keeping dietary laws and other uh, Jewish rituals and so forth and ignoring the, the others as though they are second class citizens and Paul calls him on it and that's when he gives goes into this uh, talk about you know wh why, why are you expecting these people to do things that you don't even do, that is not required of anybody, and yet you're trying to put something on them that is not called uh, of God for them to do in the first place. You're behaving like a hypocrite. And what's ironic about this is it's the same thing that's taught today, a mixture of law and grace. And it's missing the whole point because Back to my original premise, the reason people do not declare and see manifestation is because they still have this lingering Old Testament kind of mentality that is still being preached in all over Christendom, uh, on television, wherever there are quote-unquote Christian preachers, you're hearing this mixture, this, you know, you you got to be saved by grace, but then you got a part to play in how this all plays out, and God will only bless you if you, you know, behave a certain way and fulfill all these obligations and all right. And a lot of this is just downright religious garbage. It's not in the Bible. It's nowhere found in the Bible. But starving people will eat almost anything. They get hungry enough, praise the Lord. But the problem is, isn't always the pastors because oftentimes uh, that's what people want. They want milk. And uh, usually we get what we want, except here. <laughs> but the truth is milk is what a lot of people really want. They don't want the truth. They, they want just more milk. So here's what I'm saying. The work is finished. Now, the only part you play in this is 
when it comes to obedience, it has nothing to do with you being saved or unsaved, whether God loves you or doesn't love you, whether uh, God wants you blessed or not. I mean, obviously he wants you blessed because he's already done everything in order for you to be blessed. By his stripes you were healed. He became poor that you could become rich. All of these things have already been done. Now it's a question of how do we participate with God in order to see these things manifest into this realm. Well, it's about bringing the kingdom in a lot of ways, and that kingdom is in us. So let me just give you, uh, let's go to Mark chapter 11, verses 12 through 14. And I'll show you some basic principles that, that God wants us to understand. Because people think, because of the way the Scripture has been taught over the past, they think it's always a gimmick of some kind. You know, it's the latest, like I was talking about Sunday, it's the latest spiritual uh, trend that's going around. You know, so we're going to do that. This is age old. This is from the foundation. This is what the way God started everything. He spoke, and then it manifests. He tells us we're to do the same thing. We look at things that are not as though they are. We declare by the words of our testimony, the blood of the Lamb, we are overcomers. That's in every situation, whether it's financial, whether it's physical, whether whatever it is. That's how you become a victorious in what Christ has already given you victory in, by declaring it. So this isn't a gimmick. This isn't just some new thing that came along with name it and claim it. This has always been here. People always twist and pervert and whatever and make it the gospel. The gospel is the grace of Jesus Christ. But within that grace... There, there are principles that we are to follow in order to accomplish what Jesus has given us by grace. So, here we have Jesus. It says, on the morrow when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. This is speaking of Jesus. And then he saw a fig tree off having leaves, and he came, if haply he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. So Jesus comes to this fig tree, who, which looks like it ought to bear fruit, but it doesn't bear any fruit. Right? So he curses the fig tree. He speaks to the fig tree and he says, You'll never bear fruit again. Right? All right. Now, let's, let's read on. In fact, let's just go, let's go to verse 20. Because the fig tree is unfruitful, Jesus curses it. Now, in verse 20, it says, And in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Now, they had passed this thing on the way to Bethany. Now they're on their way back to Jerusalem. And they see the fig tree again the following day. Only this time, now, it's dried up from the roots. Now, he cursed it the day before. Didn't look like anything had happened. But they come back one day later and it's dried up from the roots. And the disciples remember it, right? Now, what happened between verse 14 and verse 20? Well, we could go there, and if Sheila wants to pull that up, 15 through 19, what you'll see is he went and cleansed the temple. They came to Jerusalem. Jesus went into the temple, began to cast out them that sold and bought the temple and threw the tables up, the money changers, the seats of them, sold doves and would not suffer that any man should carry a vessel through the temple. He taught, saying unto them, it is not written, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. What is prayer? Prayer is not begging God. Prayer is agreeing with God. Prayer is saying what God has said about it. Anything, anything other than that is either begging or trying to change God's mind. And you're not going to get anywhere with either one. What he wants to know is, what have I said? If you'll agree with that, it'll come to pass. So he goes to the temple. After he curses this fig tree, he goes to the temple. Now, nothing is manifested. Right? The tree looked just like it did before. He spoke to the tree, but the tree didn't, didn't look any different. So between the time that he speaks this thing and the manifestation of that thing, he cleanses the temple. Now, don't, don't think wrong here, because I know the, our first in, instinct is to say, okay, then we've got to cleanse ourselves. We've got to get right. But that's not what's happening here. 
We are the temple of God. Uh, John chapter 2, verse 19. Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. He's the temple, right? All right. 1 Corinthians, we're his body. So we're the temple. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Praise the Lord. So while you confess and you're waiting for manifestation, God is removing things from your temple. Things like unbelief. Things like what you've experienced in the past. Things like uh, wrong confessions from the past, like experiences that you've had and why you shouldn't see what it is you're supposed to see. You understand what I'm saying? There are lies. Jesus said, you've made this a den of thieves. Now, who's the thief? This enemy comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. And how does he do it? He's got to come against your body. He's got to come against your flesh. He's got to get you to think in terms that are opposite or not in agreement with God. So he comes to your temple and starts making accusation. Who are you to think that you're going to get this, that you're going to be healed, that you're going to get a financial breakthrough, that your relationship will be restored? I mean, come on. You're, you're, you're screwing up all the time. You know, you understand what I'm saying? He comes to defile the temple. And that's what happens. The scripture says, immediately when the word came, the devil comes to steal the word. So you make a profession, and immediately the enemy's there to, to give all kinds of evidence for why this can't happen. So there's a period of time between the original declaration and the manifestation that there has to be some temple cleaning going on. There has to be some ridding yourself of that doubt, of the fears, of all the lies of the enemy, of all the things you've experienced in the past that t try to tell you this can't happen. You understand what I'm saying? This is a principle. There's nothing in the Bible that is not for our edification, that is not for our learning, for doctrine, for, for correction, instruction in righteousness. Instruction in righteousness. Not for how do you are to be righteous, because he's already made you righteous, but how you live as that righteous person. Because the enemy wants to convince you that you are not righteous, that you have no right to deserve or expect to get your breakthrough or to get your answer to prayer or your profession. There should be no manifestation for you because you're not good enough. That's the immaturity of the church. It's why we have no consistency when it comes to healing and deliverance and all the other things that God has already done for us because we see things as gimmicks rather than actual spiritual ways to live. As a new creature in Christ, you don't live the way you used to live. I'm not talking about whether you do good things or bad things. I'm talking about the principle by which you live. It's no longer based on what you do. It's based on what he's done. Now it's only based on what you say in agreement with what he's done that you get manifestation from. So the enemy has to get you to a place where you won't be a consistent declarer. You become like you're tossed by every wind of doctrine, every circumstance, every situation. This is what's so hideous and demonic about preaching sin all the time. Because it keeps people on milk. Well, they can never be declaring the truth. They're always in half-truths and mixture. Praise the Lord. So, hallelujah. What He says, my house is a house of prayer. And again, let me just reemphasize this. For us as believers... Prayer is not what it is for the uh, unsaved. Right? I mean, we're not praying to get God to do stuff for us. We, we converse with God. We have relationship with God. We just talk with God. 
Our prayer is agreeing with what God says. Thank you, Lord, for the job. Thank you for the finances. Thank you for the relationship. Thank you for, for victory. Thank you, Lord, that I'm healed. You know, when I had the hepatitis C thing going on, when I started declaring this stuff, I had it. It was there, full blown. They were, you know, all the liver stuff that, you know, you're going to have to have a trans. Uh, a new liver, praise the Lord. You're going to have to have a transplant. You're going to have, I mean, that's the only way you're going, to, you're going to live a normal life. Now, I saw in the Word, God said, by my stripes you were healed. So that's what I confessed. That's what I declared, and then that's what I confessed. But I confessed it for a year and a half without manifestation. Amen? Don't you know this temple had to be cleansed quite often? Because the enemy was constantly coming with other evidence, with other facts that were denying what God's Word had said and what I had declared. So every day I had to declare it. Every day I confessed what God said about it. Every day I cleansed the temple. You know, because believe me, the enemy was still coming with, you know, come on, man. You know, you don't have any right to to be healed. You don't have, you know, you're, you're not perfect. You're screwing up all the time. You don't, you don't deserve this. And this is for people who really got it together and, you know, all this stuff. See what I'm saying? Amen? Look, look at John 10.10. 10. It's, the, it's the enemy who comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Praise the Lord. Thief cometh not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I'm come that they might have life, and they might have it more abundantly. So anything that is, that is depriving you of what the will of God is for your life, and the will of God for your life is to prosper, to be in health even as your soul prospers, for all your relationships to be made whole. I know it sounds like pie in the sky, but that's the will of God. That's, that's what the kingdom of God is supposed to produce in our life. Praise the Lord. If it's not, then there's some stealing going on in the temple. There's money changers in there trying to rip you off for stuff that has nothing to do with God. Praise the Lord. They're trying to steal, kill, and destroy. If they can steal your confidence, then they'll destroy your future. They'll see to it that you never see the manifestation of what it is you're declaring. It'll kill your confidence in God. Praise the Lord. Right. That's right. <laughs> that's why I say that. That's why I say that the we have to. The key is first of all, we need to declare, "I am the righteousness of God in Christ." We need to be declaring that all the time, regardless of what the enemy's saying, regardless of even what I'm doing. Okay, because that is the first step in everything else. If I don't, if I haven't declared my righteousness that God has already declared, 
that I am. He said, you are the righteousness of God in Christ. I've got to speak it back. I have to declare this. I have to be in agreement with God so that there is therefore now no condemnation because out of that grows everything else so that I can then declare to my circumstances and situations what God has said about it and expect the result that God has promised. See, Jesus was perfect. When he declared that that fig tree would never grow another fig, he didn't need a manifestation, but his disciples did. He didn't wring his hands and say, maybe we better take another road back to Jerusalem tomorrow just in case it hasn't manifested. No, he went right back down the same road, and they all saw the thing had withered from the root up. Why? Because there was no doubt, no unbelief. I only say what my Father says. I only do what my Father does. And it shall come to pass, even as I have spoken. See, Now, we are just like Jesus. That's the big leap for us. Because we didn't live our lives perfect. Right? He did. And we got the great exchange. We got the reward for His living His life perfectly, and He got the punishment for our living our lives despicably. So now we have a right... And actually, we have a responsibility to declare what he has declared about us. If you believe that, then you can get whatever it is you're believing for. Now, let me show you something else. Second Chronicles chapter 29, and we'll read verse 3 here. Because this is, it is throughout the Bible. The Old Testament is just simply shadows, types and shadows of, of the truth that God wants to reveal, which he does reveal then in the New Testament. It says, He, in the first year of his reign, in the first month, opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. Now, if you go back to chapter 28, you'll see that this is a new king. The old king did all kinds of crap. And the temple was full of junk, idols, uh, prostitution, all kinds of stuff was going on in there. Lies, false beliefs, right? Along comes the new king, and the first thing that he does is he opens the doors of the house of the Lord and repairs them. All right? Look at, uh, let's look at verses 16 and 17 there in 29. And the priests went into the inner part of the house of the Lord to cleanse it and brought out all the uncleanness that they found in the temple of the Lord into the court of the house of the Lord, and the Levites took it to carry it out abroad into the brook Kidron. Now, remember, we're not talking about... The, the, the metaphor here is not about our sin. This is about false believing, idols, all these other things that, that, that they had. That's representative of our misunderstanding or, or not believing what God has said based on teachings and so on and so forth, just like what, what uh, Laura just said. All right? Now, they began on the first day of the first month to sanctify, and on the eighth day of the month came they to the porch of the Lord. So they sanctified the house of the Lord in eight days, and in the sixteenth day of the first month they made an end. Praise the Lord. Now, what, what they're saying is they went in and began to cleanse to get all this stuff out of there that shouldn't have been there in the first place. Wrong beliefs, doubts, fear. I'm talking about relative to us under the new covenant as the temple of God, right? We are the temple, the house of the Lord. And where do the repairs start? When the doors opened, right? Now, look at Psalms 141, verse 3. Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. Praise the Lord. Open your mouth in agreement with God. Right? The repairs will begin on the inside. But eventually they'll be visible from the outside. But it has to start in here. It has to start in where we believe. In, in other words, you're not going to say th something you don't believe, not with any authority. Nothing comes out of your mouth except what you've already thought. Right? I mean, you can't say something without thinking it. 
That's why he says you have to have your minds renewed to the Word of God so that then what comes out of your mouth will be what you believe so that you'll get that. But the enemy's whole purpose is to come as an accuser and get you to believe differently than what, what God has declared about you so that he can, so that he can somehow uh, bring wrong beliefs into the temple. False beliefs. Idols. I mean, the whole idea of, of mostly of what religion is about is idolatry. It's, it's self-worship. Will worship, it's called. Determination. That's idolatry. And we've got to get that out of us in order to be able to speak to the things the way God speaks to them. It starts with opening your mouth. Just like it started here. The first thing they did, open the doors. And the change will begin right there. See, the devil attacks you by getting you to shut up. Anybody ever go through depression? I go through it about once a month. Seriously. It's horrible. Because there's no real explanation for it. You just feel miserable. And there's no, you can't really put a finger on it. You don't know what it is. It's just like everything's bad, you know? Most everybody goes through it. Most people just don't know it. <laughs> Sometimes ignorance is bliss. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But if you know you're miserable, it's worse. <laughs> you think it's just well life, but no, this is serious stuff. You know, it's like the old story. Uh, it's not paranoia if you know they're out to get you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So, uh, but I'm saying the way to, the way you have to combat it is what God says, not what you're feeling. Exactly. You've got to agree with what God says. You've got to declare what God says, even if it feels like everything other than that. That's called faith. And it's not a feeling. It's a mindset. It's a determination. It's a declaration. How do you get saved? You confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. Everything in the kingdom works the same way. To get Jesus, you confess Jesus. To get your financial breakthrough, you confess financial breakthrough. To get healed, you confess your healing. Amen? To get your relationship, you confess the wholeness and the, and the goodness of your relation. You confess the will of God. Because it's the will of God that none should perish, but all come to a change of their mind about God. Praise the Lord. So, hallelujah. He wants to shut us up, or He wants to change our declaration so He can steal your testimony and kill your future and destroy the manifestation that God wants for your life. Praise the Lord. I'm talking about growing up. I mean, we're going in a you know, long way around this thing, but I'm telling you what maturity is because if we grow up into the full stature of Jesus, we're going to be speaking to things, and we should expect a 24-hour manifestation. Amen. Mark, praise the Lord. He spoke it in the shower, and 24 hours later, he got the manifestation. Amen. It, he hasn't gotten the full manifestation, but he got enough of the manifestation to know that God was in it to show him something to encourage him to declare and keep declaring until the full manifestation is, is visible, until you actually see what it is you've been saying. And the enemy's job is to throw everything out there he can to, to give you reasons to not believe in what it is you're declaring. You don't deserve it. You're not good enough. You haven't prayed enough. You haven't fasted enough. You haven't read the Bible enough. You haven't been good enough. The accuser of the brethren. That's why he does it. He does it to keep you from getting the manifestation that God has. That's how he tries to dis, uh, uh, disrespect God by causing people to think, well, why didn't God do it? 
He said this by His stripes I'm healed, but He didn't do it for me. So how do I believe? I don't know what God's going to do. He's capricious. One day He wants to bless, the next day He's paying me back for something. That's the devil. That's what the devil does. He sneaks into the temple, into the flesh, and starts planting. The flesh is not just this thing that we're wearing. It's right here between our ears. It's our thoughts. It's the way we react. Because this flesh won't do, this, this body won't do anything that I don't send a message to. It can't pick my nose, my seat, my nothing. It can't do anything unless I send a signal. Right? Praise the Lord. So, see that right there. Hallelujah. Well, most of us have learned to govern those thoughts, at least in public, because other things are not socially acceptable. Right? We discipline the way we think according to the mores and the customs and so on and so forth of the culture that we live in. Well, we live in the kingdom of God. Actually, the kingdom of God lives in us. But it only manifests when I agree with it. When I open the doors, what's inside can come out. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So i got to make sure what I'm believing is in agreement with what God says so that I can then get what it is God has already spoken into my life. Understand what I'm saying? This is growing up. This is called maturity. But we're taught a whole different thing that it's about what you do, not what you say. If it's about what you do, we're all hopeless. Because the church has been operating on that premise for 2,000 years and it it has failed miserably. This is about Jesus. It's about the finished work of the cross that gives us a right to declare what He has given. This is our inheritance. God wants you to open your door to manifestation. And that will push out the thieves that would rob you. Jesus is the Word. When He went into that temple, everything went upside down. Everything that wasn't the way it was supposed to be, got out. Right? When we are in agreement with the Word of God, the stuff's got to go that doesn't belong. The lies, the deceptions, the unbelief, the condemnation, the fear. Amen? Now he says, how do you do it? It's done by the Spirit of God. Jesus said it's... it's, uh, by the washing, how do you? What do you clean with? Water. Praise the Lord. Sheila knows what. What you use water. You use lots of water. Amen. Anybody that does any cleaning, and we all have to clean somewhere, sometime. You know, water is one of the best cleansing agents there are. Or is. Praise the Lord. So Jesus says that you are to wash. Amen with the water by the Word. By the Word of God. You take what God says and you cleanse that temple. You wash it. And then what He says is something even more dramatic, that once you start doing that, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. Praise the Lord. So it's the Spirit of God that begins to flow And it's always in agreement with God. Amen? It never disagrees with God. Rivers of living water. Look at John 7, uh, verses 38 and 39, and we'll quit. But this is what I'm talking about. That's why, this is why we confess. Not, not to be a gimmick, not to have something to do, to take up some extra time in the preliminaries, not, we do it because this is the principle by which we are to live. This is how everything manifests in the kingdom of God is by words. Words that are in agreement with God. And if we agree with Him, it has to come to pass. It has to. It isn't a question of whether. It has to. It's just a question of when. 
See, the, the fig tree was destroyed the moment Jesus spoke. It just wasn't manifest yet. It took 24 hours for that to manifest, but it was dead. It was dead the moment he spoke. It took 24 hours for that reality to get up to the leaves and the branches and the limbs. It was true of the root, and that's where all the, 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 the energy and life comes from for a plant or a tree or whatever. He spoke to the root of that thing, and it died the moment he opened his mouth and spoke to it. But it took time for that reality to be vis vis visual to people who were just passing by. Now, it's the same way with us. I was healed the moment I agreed with God based on what God had done 2,000 years ago. But it took a year and a half before the world caught up with it. Before the doctor's tests and exams and scans and blood tests and everything else agreed with what God had already told me. But it was done the moment I agreed with God. Our problem is we think God is in time. He's not in time. He's outside of time. Time doesn't mean anything to God. A day is a thousand years. A thousand years is a day. Well, let's hope it doesn't take all day. <laughs> this thing accomplished, praise the Lord. But you understand what I'm saying. We measure everything. You know, we want to, well, if it doesn't happen in 36 hours, well, you know, God's not going to do it. Or if it doesn't happen in a week, whatever. You know, I'm just saying, you, you continue to declare what God has said. It has to manifest. Praise the Lord. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. If you believe on him the way the Scripture says, you are the righteousness of God in Christ because of him. Out of you will come a cleansing flood that will cleanse this temple, that will keep this temple in agreement with God. Right? Right? In other words, the, as long as you've got your head right, the enemy can't come and mess with the temple. He can come, but he can't do anything about it because out of you is flowing this truth, this power of God, this anointing of God that will not allow anything that is not in agreement with God to dominate in your life. But you've got to be in agreement with the head first, that you are the righteousness of God in Christ. Amen? But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Well, he's been glorified, and, he, and the Holy Ghost has been given, and we now have it. Praise the Lord. But just like in the temple in Chronicles, nobody could see what was going on inside. Right? The kingdom of God is in you. It's not meat and drink. It's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Just because everybody can't see it, just because you can't see it, doesn't make it not there. And it's out of that righteousness. Now, why would you have peace? Because all of your needs are met. Why would you have joy? Joy unspeakable and full of glory. Why? Because all is good. Life is good. Praise the Lord. I have a good expectation. Tomorrow's going to be even better. Praise the Lord. So you can't see what's going on inside. But if you open the doors, it is made manifest. Praise the Lord. Give the Lord a hand clap. So the result, the result is manifestation. The result is maturity. The result is the full stature of Jesus Christ. Amen? Imagine that. When you speak to things that are not, they become. That's the full stature of Jesus. We're not talking about perfect living in terms of a sinless life. We've already been declared that. But that's not our issue. Our issue is to speak in agreement just like Jesus and expect the miracle. That is not a miracle to us. It's only a miracle to the world. To us, it's a way of life. To us, it's the natural result of, of declaring what God has already said about us. Just like I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I am. I am. Because that's what he said. 
Praise God. I, by His stripes, I am healed. has nothing to do with what I'm feeling. I am. And it has to manifest if I don't waver from that truth. All of my needs are met according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now that, that means I'm not just eking out here. I'm not just getting by. They're being met super abundantly according to the riches in heaven. Not according to me, not according to the way that I would just pay them off, but according to the riches of heaven. It's it's like a floodgate is opened and the blessings come down and I can't even contain them. Amen? Even your enemies will be at peace with you. That's talking about relationships that, you know, just are totally dysfunctional. But they're all made whole. Why? Because that is the will of God for you. Because you're His child. Because you are the righteousness of God in Christ. Because you deserve it. It's not a reward. Amen? It's an inheritance. You get it simply because you deserve it. You didn't do anything to get it. You got born again. That made you eligible. That made you the heir. You didn't do anything to get born the first time, did you? And you didn't do anything to get born the second time except to agree. I heard a guy say this. You may have heard this before, but it's it's the same principle. That it with the, the story that Jesus gives the parable of the shepherd that leaves the flock and goes out after that one lamb. It's all in the context of repentance. But what did the lamb do? that the shepherd went and got. It didn't do nothing. It just laid there and let him pick it up. And he carries it back and they have a big celebration because the one that was lost is found. What what was repentant? What, What did that lamb do to repent? He just agreed to be saved. You understand what I'm saying? It takes all of the effort out of this for us. There is no effort on our part. We have been declared this. Now we're operating out of that declaration of God. God is saying, you deserve to have good relationships. Period. You deserve it. That's your inheritance. You deserve the best jobs. You deserve the best income. You deserve the best health. See, we're, you know, we're, we're struggling with that right now. Because it's too good. But that's the abundant life. That's the super abundance that God wants to put on us. And we don't, do we deserve it? No, we don't deserve it. But it has nothing to do with that. We have it coming because of our inheritance. We deserve it in the sense that, that Jesus did not deserve our punishment. He deserves all of this and more, right? He deserves everything. That's our inheritance because he took ours, which was death, condemnation, separation from God. I said Sunday, I'll just I'll quit with this, but look, the the proof of this is the resurrection. Because if if he was, if any of our sins were not dealt with, past, present, or future, God could not have justified raising him from the dead. He is the just and the justifier. The proof that I am the righteousness of God in Christ is not whether my day was good or bad. The proof is he is risen. The proof is he is alive. And because he's alive, I'm alive. Amen? Because he's seated at the right hand, I'm seated with him. The right hand is the position of power and authority. And that's exactly what he's given us in this earth. And we create the kingdom. We'll talk about that more Sunday. But that's the reality is here. The king, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How does the kingdom come? 
when we speak it out of our mouth because the kingdom is in us. When we declare the righteousness of God is who I am. The kingdom shows up. When I declare by his stripes I'm healed, the kingdom shows up in healing, right? When I declare he became poor that I could become rich, when I prosper, the kingdom is being revealed. You see what I'm saying? And he wants his kingdom to fill the earth. And the only way it can happen is the way this earth was created in the first place, by declaration and then believing in what we say. Say it till it manifests, and it will manifest. Give the Lord a hand clap. Praise the Lord. Amen. All right. God bless you. You are dismissed in the name of the Lord. Do this now. We're, this isn't just, we're not doing this just to teach something for the sake of teaching it. This is how we grow up. This is how we mature. This is how we take the kingdom of darkness. Amen.